Good evening, good morning to everyone. <coughs> uh, we will begin now uh, with the opening uh, recitations. Seven branch uh, worship uh, we will do in English, Spanish, uh, Chinese uh, simultaneously. In all the worlds of the ten directions reside Tathagatas of the three times. Before each of you lions among humans, I prostrate joyfully with body, speech, and mind. By the power of this aspiration to noble deeds, all conquerors appear vividly in my mind. With as many bodies as there are atoms in all lands, I prostrate to all you conquerors. In each atom are Buddhas numerous as atoms, all in the midst of the heirs of the Buddhas. Thus I conceive of this Dharmadhatu as completely filled with you conquerors in this way. With infinite oceans of praise and oceans of diverse melodies, I sink the excellent qualities of all you conquerors and praise all of you gone to bliss. With the best flowers and best garlands, best music ointments and excellent parasols, finest lamps and superior incense, I offer to you conquerors. With excellent garments and best fragrances and sandalwood powder heap high as Mount Meru, 
all wondrous offerings perfectly arranged I offer to you, conquerors. These vast and unequal offerings to each and every one of you, conquerors, with the power of conviction and noble deeds, I prostrate and offer to all you conquerors. All the harmful deeds that I have done with my body, speech, and mind, under the power of desire, hatred, and ignorance, I confess each and every one of them. I rejoice in all the meritorious deeds of all conquerors in the ten directions and the heirs of the Buddhas, solitary realizers, hearers still in training and beyond, and all wandering beings. You who are lamps of the worlds of the ten directions, who have unobstructedly attained Buddhahood through the stages of Bodhi, all you who are my protectors, please turn the unexcelled wheel of Dharma. With palms together, I earnestly beseech you who may intend to manifest final Nirvana, please remain for as many eons as there are atoms in the world, for the happiness and well-being of all wandering beings. Whatever slight virtue that may have been gathered through prostrating, offering, confessing, rejoicing, requesting, and beseeching, I now dedicate to complete Bodhi. Now the brief uh, mandala offering and request uh, for the teachings. This, this ground sprinkled with scented waters and strewn with flowers, adorned with the supreme mountain and four continents, I visualize as a Buddha land and offer it. May all migrators experience such a pure land. To the gurus who possess the three kayas, I offer the outer, inner, secret and suchness offerings. With my body, wealth, and all phenomenal existence, please grant the unsurpassed supreme attainment. Whatever slight virtue I may have gathered through prostrations, offerings, confessing, rejoicing, requesting, and beseeching, I now dedicate it all to complete awakening. Om Guru Deva Dakini Ratna Mandala Pratija Soha. Please turn the wheel of Dharma of the greater, lesser, and common vehicles in accordance with the dispositions and mental capacities of sentient beings. Andruje jamwan dile naro dhamma mi da po padu ji din gong ka din sun den sa ve la me sham sa ju la ma yi dam cho gyong la su wa dep su da ji 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 lu gya ben gi do me san ling gen da pe dun sun yong la gyo so me gya wa du ji chang pa ji din gong po sha la du du ta du sam gyo gyo le me jin ji lo shi tu ji ji ning gi mun pa sin ne gyo sin cho de du du pra ji ji lu Guru So again, uh, good evening, good morning to everyone that is uh, with us today. Uh, I really appreciate that uh, I have this opportunity uh, to spend some time uh, in a meaningful way twice a week uh, with all of you um, to learn more about uh, this text uh, composed by Shantideva. Um, which we can say uh, kind of distills uh, all the Mahayana teachings, uh, all the Mahayana teachings uh, into this one, uh, uh, not too short, not too long uh, uh, volume um, that brings together uh, all the uh, trainings that Bodhisattvas uh, have to uh, go through in order to actualize the final result of complete Buddhahood.
when we say, uh, when we use here in this context uh, the name Mahayana, um, we should understand that this is not uh, a label identifying, uh, say, like, oh, the Buddhist, the kind of Buddhism in Korea, or the kind of Buddhism in China, or the kind of Buddhism in this place or that place. Uh, we're not using this label Mahayana uh, in this way. Here Mahayana, which literally means the great vehicle, is referring to um, practicing the Dharma, practicing the Buddha Dharma with this great motivation of uh, achieving Buddhahood for the sake of all mother sentient beings. That's, 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 that's all we mean, you know, when we say uh, the Mahayana practices, Mahayana teachings, Mahayana tradition, uh, we're talking about any and all of those teachings and practices that emphasizes that the only meaningful goal uh, that we should aim for uh, is this goal of achieving Buddha, achieving the awakened state, the fully awakened state for the sake and the benefit of all beings. This is the definition of Mahayana. Then whenever we hear terms like maha, when, when somebody says great, uh, this is the greater, then immediately, right, uh, a thought arises. Then what is the lesser? Uh, if this is the greater, what is the lesser? Right? So likewise, then there is the term called hinayana, lesser vehicle. Now here, again, lesser vehicle or Hinayana, again, we don't use it as a label uh, to refer to uh, the type of Buddhism practice in this culture or that country uh, or this place in Southeast Asia or that other place. No, uh, we're not using this label Hinayana in, as a uh, way to identify, right? certain groups of Buddhists that exist in the world today. Rather, just like the way we're using the term Mahayana, here then Hinayana means practicing the Buddha Dharma for primarily our own freedom from suffering.
So especially here, uh, uh, for example, uh, especially in, 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 on this topic, Gyobajik Densungan, founder of Dugong Kagyu, uh, he says, uh, he points out, he says, uh, you cannot say uh, that Hinayana uh, practitioners don't have love and compassion. He says, of course, Hinayana practitioners have love and compassion because the practice of love and compassion uh, is universally taught by the Buddha uh, to all his disciples. Uh, so he says, Hinayana has love and compassion. Mahayana has love and compassion. But Mahayana has something hmm, that in the Hinayana approach hmm, doesn't have. And what is that? That's bodhicitta. And then here, what is bodhicitta? Bodhicitta then is on the basis of love and compassion, right? On the basis of love and compassion, then given rise to the great resolve, uh, the courageous resolve to do whatever it takes uh, to become Buddha. So that as Buddha, as fully awakened ones, we can more effectively benefit all sentient beings. So this great resolve, uh, this courageous resolve that we call bodhicitta, this is what makes, uh, whether we are practicing Hinayana or we're practicing Mahayana, is determined by this uh, absence or presence of this great motivation. So if you ask me, right, I would say, well, among those who practice Chinese Buddhism, there are many who are Mahayana practitioners, and there are many who are Hinayana practitioners. Among Theravada uh, practitioners, there are many uh, that are Mahayana practitioners, and there are many that are Hinayana practitioners. Likewise, among those who practice Tibetan Buddhism, uh, there are many who are Mahayana, and there are also many that are Hinayana. Uh, because it is not about what you chant, it is not about what sutras you read or you don't read, uh, it is not about whether you uh, venerate bodhisattvas or you venerate the great arhats, it's not about whether you know you know Pali or Sanskrit or Tibetan. It's not about those things. It's about huh, this absence or presence of bodhicitta.
Now, of course, you, you can say, uh, perhaps, uh, that, oh, but in Tibetan Buddhism and in Chinese Buddhism, uh, there is so much talk about bodhicitta, uh, generating bodhicitta, generating bodhicitta, generating bodhicitta, the bodhisattva path, the bodhisattva this, the bodhisattva that. Uh, then you say, uh, surely, right, mm, they are all Mahayana. Well, uh, I don't think it's so straightforward because sometimes, you know, if we talk a lot about bodhicitta, but we have not actually generated bodhicitta, then it's just empty talk, you know. And frankly, again, you know, this is just my own maybe deluded uh, perception. Uh, I find that, you know, among those who practice uh, Tibetan Buddhism, mm, especially in Asia, I think, uh, sometimes, you know, I even wonder, are they even uh, practitioners of Buddha Dharma? Uh, forget about whether they are even Hina whether they are Hinayana, they are Mahayana. Sometimes I'm not even sure if they are actually practicing Buddha Dharma. Uh, why? Because uh, if we practice Buddha Dharma, hmm, one of the clearest signs of whether we're practicing Buddha Dharma or not is uh, whatever it is that we're practicing, hmm, are they uh, in service of the eight worldly concerns? Hmm, or uh, are we practicing the Buddha Dharma hmm, to be done with the eight worldly concerns. So especially, you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, because the Vajrayana methods are very extensive, and it's easy to misunderstand these Vajrayana methods, because Vajrayana methods, right, will say, and we'll have like, oh, this is for longevity. Oh, this is for abundance. Oh, this is for attraction. Oh, this is for this, this is for that. Uh, that can very easily be misinterpreted and mispracticed uh, to puff up the eight worldly concerns. Uh, and if we are using Dharma, if we're using Buddha Dharma in that way, then it's not even, uh, we have not even yet entered uh, the path uh, to liberation much less liberating all mother sentient beings. Yeah, so anyway, uh, these are some uh, kind of preliminary uh, remarks uh, that I hope uh, we will uh, kind of remember. Yeah? So when we say, you know, the Bodhijayavatara, uh, 
uh, is uh, the main subject in Bodhicaravatara, is the subject of uh, the quintessence of Mahayana practice, Mahayana path. Uh, what we're talking about is this great motivation uh, that we call Bodhicitta. So we are now uh, in chapter 4. Uh, in chapter 3, uh, we have taken uh, the Bodhisattva vow. Uh, we have generated uh, Bodhicitta, uh, aspiration Bodhicitta. And so then now, uh, how do we uh, carry out uh, the engagement Bodhicitta vow? We have generated both. In, in chapter 3, we have generated both the action bodhicitta vow and we have generated the action bodhicitta vow. So now, starting in chapter 4, Shantideva starts talking about how do we actually, how do we now put into work these two aspects of bodhicitta. So first thing is, uh, in chapter 4, the title is uh, carefulness. Mm -hmm. How to take care uh, not to uh, compromise the vow that we have just taken. This carefulness is necessary to prevent us from uh, giving up our vow through neglect, uh, giving up our vow uh, through uh, the afflictive emotions taking over. So we have looked at uh, verses 1 to 12, uh, and uh, we ended uh, at around 12. Mm, and basically, uh, in those verses there, uh, Shantideva uh, is uh, kind of pointing out, you know, and say that, you know, uh, we, we, we have taken such a... a, a, a an amazing, uh, unbelievable uh, promise. And now uh, we don't have the choice anymore uh, to, to say, oh, actually, I was kidding. Uh, oh, actually, you know, I, 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 I didn't mean it. Uh, it says, now we cannot let down. Uh, so using kind of emotional language, he says, you know, don't let down the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas uh, because they were so happy uh, when we took this vow. Also, don't let down sentient beings uh, because they were so hopeful uh, uh, when we invited them to come along with us uh, on this journey uh, to uh, great awakening. Uh, and then if now uh, you, you like, uh, like, you know, the day after, so to say, you know, you woke up and you say, oh, wait, uh, actually, I, I don't mean it. Uh, he says, that would be really terrible. Uh, so he even uses very strong language and says, you know, uh, breaking a promise like that. Uh, if you break the promise to one person, mm, if you break your promise to make one person happy, mm, 
and that has negative consequences. Can you imagine uh, breaking your commitment to bring all beings to happiness? Uh, he says, uh, that kind of uh, breaking of promise, you know, can only lead uh, to terrible futures uh, in the hell realm. So very strong words, even. Uh, so so he's now using a little bit bit of like um, scare tactic, uh, which has its place. You know, sometimes if we think dharma is all just you know relax and easy, and you know, then no way you know we can fight the afflictive emotions. Uh, so verses two and three, he's saying, you know, in case you have uh, what we call bias regret, you know, uh, during this pandemic, I'm sure, you know, you've gone online and, you know, you're feeling a little bit down and you hit buy, you know, and then the next day or the day after or two days later, you're like, oh, why did I buy that? Right. Uh, bias regret. Uh, so in case you have bias regret, with, with, with reference to generating bodhicitta, verse two and three, he's saying, don't, yeah, because uh, the, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have already uh, analyzed this product, so to say, uh, and this is the best thing that you can do. Uh, so stay the course, uh, don't waver from that. That's two and three. Mm -hmm. Four, uh, five, mm -hmm. Uh, and six hmm, is basically saying uh, what I mentioned earlier. Uh, now that we have made this promise, you know, uh, that has made the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas so happy uh, and also made all sentient beings uh, so hopeful uh, that we are going to accomplish, uh, to, to accomplish this goal for the benefit of all. Uh, if we now say, oh, sorry, uh, I was just joking. I wasn't thinking straight. Then it says, you know, that can lead uh, only to the lower realms. So that's four, five, and six. Uh, seven and eight further uh, makes that point. Uh, seven is almost, you can say, is raising a counterpoint uh, or raising a doubt and say, 
Wait, aren't there examples of some um, great beings who gave up bodhicitta, but then in the end, you know, they were okay? Uh, so Seven says, you know, those cases that you're thinking of, uh, it's not as straightforward as you think it is. Uh, and then it goes on to say, basically, uh, in, on verse 8, it says, basically, for bodhisattvas, uh, there is no greater danger uh, than uh, uh, kind of uh, giving up uh, this promise that we have made. Uh, in fact, all the other negative actions of body, speech, and mind uh, will not have such a devastating effect as uh, us losing our bodhicitta, uh, losing this resolve, losing this great vow, losing uh, this commitment that we have made. Uh, because when we, and so it says, you know, guard this carefully, uh, carefully. Nine and ten warns us to be careful with our own conduct so that our conduct will not cause others to give up their bodhisattva vow. So, uh, I mean, nine and ten on the surface is saying, you know, don't obstruct, don't halt the merit of a bodhisattva. Uh, because uh, because doing that is you're basically not just ruining that one person, uh, but all the beings that that person uh, was making a commitment to free from suffering. If you do anything that causes this one person uh, to fall away from their promise, their vow, uh, then uh, the consequences are very serious. Uh, so here I will say, well, what is the easiest way we could do that? It is if we are not careful with how we conduct ourselves uh, and cause someone else to give up uh, on bodhicitta, then that is how it happens. Uh, so, so especially those of us, you know, who say, you know, I, I take the bodhisattva vow, I generate the bodhicitta, we have to be very careful that our actions of body, speech, and mind is not going to cause uh, 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 someone who is more new in this uh, to be discouraged by the way we act. So the way we act is really important, uh, even though ultimately it's, our, it's the intention behind our actions uh, that determine uh, the result of our actions, the quality of our actions, but nonetheless, hmm, how we act is what other people can immediately see. So if our actions is causing other people to lose faith in uh, the practice of the Bodhisattva way, then we have done something very negative.
Yeah, so we should not, you know, uh, misapply uh, those teachings that say uh, intention mm, determines uh, the quality of our actions uh, and say, well, my intention was good. Uh, so then how I act uh, is not my problem if other people uh, misunderstand me. No, you cannot do that. Uh, and the Buddha, uh, that's why the Buddha gave uh, prescriptions and proscriptions hmm? uh, gave advice on what we sh how we should act and how we should not act yeah? how to maintain right speech hmm? how to even walk how to sit yeah? of course you know some of these rules are particular to the time of the Buddha uh, but from those rules we can understand what's the principle behind those things hmm? Like, for example, you know, in some of the rules, it says, uh, so for monks uh, and nuns, you know, uh, when you eat, you should not talk. Because culturally, uh, that at that time, you know, it says, you know, if you're eating and talking and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's very um, uninspiring, right? Because lay people at that time cannot accept that. Uh, that, that after they offered food to the monks and nuns, instead of like mindfully eating the food, uh, they're busy, blah, 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 you know, talking away, right? Uh, but, you know, like His Holiness, uh, the Dugum Kyabgun, he says, uh, he says, but, he, he says, he, he mentioned one time, he said he told, you know, some of his monks, uh, he says, but now that if you're going to the West, um, when you eat, you know, he says, uh, if you're with a group of people, uh, he says, of course, you know, still we remember uh, the monastic uh, rule that says you should not talk when you're eating. And he says, but then you cannot rigidly follow that uh, because in the West, uh, people will think you are rude uh, or uh, greedy to eat, uh, no time to pay attention to people around you. Uh, so he said, then you also need to adapt. Uh, so that's like the principle behind the rule, uh, which we can still take to heart. Mm -hmm. And basically the principle behind these rules is, do not do things to cause other people uh, to kind of have doubts uh, or to give up uh, on practicing Dharma. So this responsibility is very important, especially for those who uh, uh, kind of present themselves as teachers of Buddha Dharma. Uh, but even as uh, just practitioners uh, of Buddha Dharma, uh, we should appreciate this point. Uh, don't act recklessly. Especially those who are involved in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, some of us love so much crazy wisdom, you know. And Dalai Lama says, most of the time it's just crazy and no wisdom. Most of the time it's just crazy, as in your afflictive emotions are in charge. But because you have heard some superficial dharma, you now say, oh, this is crazy wisdom. He says, mostly it's just crazy. Because authentic crazy wisdom, when these great beings act, even if they act in ways that are, seems in other ways kind of outrageous, you know, but for it to be upaya, meaning skillful means, then it has to achieve the intended result for crazy wisdom or upaya to really be upaya skillful means it has to achieve the intended result if you act and then what happens is people go oh my gosh this is terrible i'm not going to practice this tradition anymore and they run away that is not skillful means. 
that is destroying Buddha Dharma. Uh, then verse 11 uh, basically says, okay, now next thing is don't. Uh, don't do this thing where, you know, you take uh, one step forward, uh, then you take two steps backward. Uh, then you take two steps forward, uh, then you take one step backward. Uh, and back and forth, back and forth. Uh, 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 you mix uh, powerful downfalls. Uh, with powerful bodhicitta, back and forth, back and forth like that. Uh, then you are just going uh, to be, uh, what we say, walking in a circle uh, and never actually reaching your destination. Don't do that. Uh, that's verse 11 uh, and 12 says, in summary, uh, I have to be careful. Uh, I have to pay attention uh, to protect uh, this vow that I have just taken. So the rest of this chapter uh, various kind of uh, considerations, various meditations uh, to keep us uh, uh, being uh, alert and protective uh, of, of a bodhisattva vow.
Um, so 13, verse 13 and 14, let's read that together. Striving for the benefit of all that lives, unnumbered Buddhas have already lived and passed away. But I, by virtue of my sins, have failed to come within the compass of their healing works. And this will always be my lot if I continue to behave like this, and I will suffer pains and bondage, wounds and laceration in the lower realms. Yes, so here, hmm, this verse, uh, these two verses, you know, uh, is saying that uh, we, we really uh, have to pay attention uh, to implementing, uh, to implementing uh, the teachings, uh, the precepts uh, that uh, is associated with the Bodhisattva vow. And it's also, he's also saying, you know, like so many Buddhas have come and gone, you know, even though it is very hard uh, in, in, in another context, it is say it is very hard uh, to encounter uh, Buddhas when they appear uh, and to have access to their teachings. Uh. But nonetheless, you know, with so many Buddhas that have come and gone, uh, surely we have met the Buddhas, some of them. Uh, or at the, at the very least, we have received teachings, but how come we are still here? <laughs> uh, here in a confused way. Uh, that's because uh, each of those past encounters, we have not uh, put in enough effort uh, to actualize those teachings. Uh, so now, he says, you know, now, now, don't waste time anymore. And then, like due to our pride, you know, we have received the teachings. Uh, due to our pride, then we face obstacles in uh, connecting to uh, a guide, a teacher, uh, who can guide us. Yes, of course, in the end, nobody can take medicine for you. You are ill, you have to take the medicine. But if you don't go to the doctor, it's going to be very hard to get well. Simply just like, not simply, but you know, like doing it on your own, you know, like attending all the online teachings that you can find, you know, and then, you know, buying all the books that you can buy, reading, listening, reading, listening. It's good. Yes, of course. But if we don't have enough merit, you know, to kind of rely on someone and have that someone kind of say, okay, now you focus on this. Yeah, and have enough merit, eh, not to want to argue, well, I don't know, I think I should. <laughs> like, we have already done so much of that, I'm sure, you know. So, we're walking around and around and around and around and around. 
And so this also um, we have to pay attention to. So that's why uh, verse 13, it says, you know, and but I, you know, by virtue of my sins have failed, eh, by virtue of my negative karma, have failed to come within the compass of their healing works. So we have not been able uh, to come close to uh, these Buddhas. So we're not, it's not just limited to the Buddhas. Now that Buddhas have passed, you know, but there are nonetheless other guides, uh, that again through due to our own uh, negative karma that then manifest as pride uh, reluctance doubt uh, uh, or fear <laughs> sometimes it's fear of the unknown fear of commitment uh, we keep circling uh, so then we cannot be healed Now, of course, you know, uh, then the opposite problem also exists, you know, people chasing after this person or that person and say, oh, be my teacher, be my teacher, be my teacher, you know, that's also not properly relying on a guide. Uh, that is just chasing after uh, fame. Uh, usually we only chase, you know, people with fancy names, fancy titles, you know. So now let's read, uh, oh, actually, uh, we'll take a break, quick break here. And after that, we come back, we'll look at 15 to 20. And let's take a short break right now. Five, 10 minutes. Walk 
Walk in, 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 walk in
Okay, let's see um, questions. Uh, let's see. Antonio, go ahead. Uh, well, I wrote a question in the chat, but I can... Uh, yes, why don't you go ahead and... Yeah, well, I was, uh, was wondering, like, uh, bodhicitta is uh, very such um, great intention, and it is uh, precious, and it is um, a way to guide us in the way in a greater um, manner. Uh, well, like you can expand um, your intention and, you know, in, so take it, the, the bodhicitta vows are important in that sense because it brought our spiritual, um, you know, uh, growth. And, but, uh, well, and also we have Hinayana vows that protect us from negative uh, doing the ne negative actions that will lead us to um, to suffering and to generate merit also in some way. Uh, so breaking both sets of vows are um, well don't uh, don't have positive results. They have negative results, but. Uh, it seems that uh, forgetting bodhicitta could be easier than breaking some Hinayana vows. So for us that maybe our commitment is weak, how can we purify breaking bodhicittas uh, or bodhisattva vows? Technical answer, uh, 35 Buddha's confession. <laughs> Wei Ting, were you able to hear the question? Yes? Okay, yeah. So you can summarize the question and then the answer. So the, the technical answer is uh, for purifying lapses and breaking of bodhicitta uh, commitment, uh, um, neglect, uh, forgetting, uh, is to do the 35 with this uh, uh, confession practice.
you mentioned the Hinayana vows uh, uh, that you said in contrast to uh, the bodhicitta uh, resolve. Mm. It's easier to see when you have uh, broken uh, the Hinayana vows. Uh, so by that, I, th I, I assume you're talking about mm, things such as the 10 non-virtues to avoid. Mm, which, by the way, as a footnote, uh, Kyoba Rinpoche says, that's not just Hinayana. Uh, the avoidance of the 10 non-virtues uh, on all three levels, uh, under individual liberation, under Bodhisattva commitment, under uh, Tantric Samaya, uh, it's all about uh, avoiding, uh, leaving behind the 10 non-virtues. Yeah, so, uh, if you know how to practice this, uh, when you keep, um, like, uh, when you keep uh, the practice of um, avoiding ten non-virtues, uh, so that's that's good because that's like a clear reference point. Uh, you ten non-virtues are like this, like this, like this. So when you have these ten non-virtues uh, that are kind of explicitly there in terms of whether you will break or not, you can see clearly. Then it's very easy to make that into uh, a Mahayana uh, level of practicing because uh, you avoid the non-virtue of killing. You know, why? For the benefit of beings. You avoid the non-virtue mm, of using uh, hurt, uh, harmful words, uh, divisive words, uh, uh, and you know the non-virtues of speech. And then you do it because uh, of not uh, of wanting to benefit beings. So if you practice the 10 non-virtues uh, based on not the limited motivation of I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> but rather for the benefit of beings then there is no need anymore uh, to think in terms of like oh this is this over here and this is this over here Uh, then repeating um, the bodhicitta vow, uh, as Kyoba Rinpoche, uh, uh, those of you who practice in Dragon tradition, you know, uh, the opening prayers, you know, all mother sentient beings, you know, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me. Yeah, so that's the aspiration bodhicitta, then the action bodhicitta. Uh, throughout the day, you know, it says six times. <laughs> in your waking hours, uh, you should, you know, check in with that. Uh, call checking in, right? 
So you find ways yeah, to work that into your daily life. But in another discussion, uh, Kyoba Rinpoche says, mm, also know that once you have generated this vow uh, through a ceremony, uh, in, in, in other words, in a formal way, uh, you have generated this vow, then this vow is like, uh, like a, a hundred dollar note that you have in your wallet uh, that you may or may not all at all times uh, think, I have a hundred dollars, 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 you know, but it's there. And so in a way, uh, having the bodhicitta doesn't mean, you know, like, like at all times walking around, uh, you're like, bodhicitta, 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 bodhicitta. Hmm? But what it does mean is that uh, the example given is like um, you have to f kind of blend your identity and bodhicitta in such a way uh, so that, for example, even when you're asleep and when you hear somebody say, Antonio, Antonio, right? Immediately, yeah? even if you're asleep, uh, half asleep, or in a dream, you know they're talking about you, All right? So it's not like you walk around, uh, even in your waking hours, forget about your sleep hours, that you go, I'm Antonio, I'm Antonio, I'm Antonio, I'm Antonio. That's not, you know, that's not uh, how you're required to hold the bodhicitta vow. Oh, I have bodhicitta vow, I have bodhicitta vow, I have bodhicitta vow, I have bodhicitta vow, you know? So you, you, you don't have to actively, uh, but you have to have an awareness enough that when you need, you go, oh yes, I have a hundred dollars in my wallet. Yeah. So now, uh, verse uh, 15 to 20 uh, from chapter 4. Uh, let's read that together uh, in the different languages, in the different uh, interpretation rooms. The appearance of the Buddhas in the world, true faith and the attainment of a human form, an aptitude for good, all these are rare. When will they come to me again? Today, indeed, I am hale and well. 
I have enough to eat and I am not in danger. But this life is fleeting, unreliable. My body is like something briefly lent. And yet the way I act is such that I shall not regain a human life. And losing this, my precious human form, my evils will be many, virtues none. Here is now my chance for wholesome deeds, but if I fail to practice virtue, what will be my lot? What shall I do, bewildered by the sorrows of the lower realms? Never there performing any virtue, only ever piling up my sins, and for a hundred million ages I will not even hear of happy destinies. This is why Lord Buddha has declared that like a turtle that perchance can place its head within a yoke adrift upon a mighty sea, this human birth is difficult to find. Uh, so these verses here, it's helping us to kind of um, strengthen uh, this quality of carefulness, uh, meaning not uh, becoming careless uh, about our bodhicitta uh, vow, right? Developing attention, developing carefulness, developing concern for our bodhicitta vow through reflecting on, through reminding ourselves uh, of how uh, basically uh, we call this, um, this precious human life that we have right now. So two things actually. First, a human life, a human existence. Then, not just an ordinary human ex uh, existence, but uh, by certain standards said to be very precious uh, and very special. Uh, so then we can, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what makes it uh, precious and special. Uh, so verse 15 says, the appearance of the Buddhas in the world, having true faith, meaning true confidence, and the attainment of a, Buddha, a human form, and an aptitude, meaning like a, a, a predisposition towards a good heart. So these four, he, 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 he specifically mentions here, he says, all these are very rare, uh, but now mm, we have these four things. Uh, in other words, if, if you're reading this text, if you're hearing these teachings, all these four things uh, you already have. Uh, but he says, have you considered you know, how rare it is to have these four conditions uh, converging together and you have this? Uh, will this happen again so easily? No. He says. Then he goes on, verse 16, he says, you know, I'm healthy and well, uh, and I have enough to eat, uh, and I'm not in like, you know, like imminent, uh, immediate danger, you know. So 
what what else do I need? You know, don't 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 I recognize this? Don't you recognize this? So this precious human life we have here. Then in more detailed teachings, huh? uh, some of you know this, right? There is what's called uh, having the eight endowments, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the eight freedoms and the ten endowments. So please look at the Jewel Ornament of Liberation for, for these uh, explanation for the eight uh, uh, leisures or freedoms and the ten endowments, uh, especially if you say, I want to take this uh, course for credit. So this is like homework, you know. Otherwise, you know, like someone uh, that was sending me a message about uh, expressing their desire to take this for credit, they say, otherwise, you know, they say, frankly, you know, it's in this year and out this year and uh, mostly nothing sticks in between. <laughs> so unless, you know, uh, you follow up, uh, you, you uh, we say, you know, like in the university, when I was still teaching at the university, we always tell students, uh, like, uh, now that you have come to college, uh, actual hours that you attend class is very little compared to your high school. Uh, but don't be fooled by this. Uh, because for every hour of instruction you receive, uh, if you really want to do well, you should spend three hours on your own. On that hour of material. Because in that hour of material, the instructor is just pointing out to you places that you should follow up on. And I think this equally applies to our Dharma study. For one hour of class, actually now, every week we have four hours. So this is like four credit hours, right? Four credit hours. If you are a diligent student, you know, each hour you should do three more hours of work outside of class. <laughs> and let's be realistic also, right? You say, no, 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 you know. I don't have 12 more hours to put into this, you know. So if you don't have three hours to put into each hour of instruction, you should at least have 30 minutes for each hour that you are going to put work into. So what you do is, so in this part, right, Shantideva here doesn't use huh, the whole extent huh, to, to persuade you on why you have such a special uh, opportunity right now. Uh, so then my job, you know, in teaching this is to say, you want to uh, know more? You want more arguments to convince you of how wonderful uh, a life you have right now? Go look at uh, this idea of being free from eight uh, states that would otherwise make it impossible for you to develop spiritually. Uh, not only being free from the eight states, uh, but you also have what's known as the 10 wealth uh, endowments, the 10 wealth. Uh, and so with these two things, uh, oh, this is amazing. Uh, so basically these verses 15 to 20, you can find also what's in here, uh, what we uh, in another context call the four thoughts 
uh, that turn your mind away from distractions. Uh, so, uh, verse 16 uh, is the beginning of the second of the four thoughts uh, that turn our mind. Uh, turn it from our habitual ways of like uh, continuing in confusion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, line 3 and 4 of verse 16, it says, But this life is fleeting and unreliable. My body is like something briefly lent. Uh, I, I loan this, you know, <laughs> I loan this for a short period of time. Uh, eventually, this I have to return, uh, return to the four elements, right? So this is the second thought, which is impermanence. Like uh, no one, you know, really uh, will think, you know, today is the day that I die. Everybody lives as if, you know, we're going to live forever then we die. So if we're not heedful, if we are not kind of uh, uh, like bring into focus, they say three things, you know, death is certain. When it will happen is uncertain. So the second point, whether tomorrow or next life will come first, Nobody knows. And then third, when we have to return this body to the four elements, you know, take it back to the car rental. <laughs> when we return this, the only thing that we take with us is not this body and all the stuff that this body possess. The only thing that we take with us is our karma the quality of our actions both skillful and unskillful follow us like a shadow follow any form so this is the second thought the second reversing from samsara contemplation good let me grab my water and i'm ready huh Waiting, did you ask a question? I'm not able to hear you if you're asking a question. Hello? Yes, can now you? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, sorry, I cannot hear you just now. Can you repeat again? 
Uh, but you have to tell me what you did or did uh, about the uh, impermanence. Uh -huh. So basically, uh, uh, it line three and four uh, is talking about uh, the second thought that turns the mind, uh, which is um, then in terms of that, it says you know we should uh, at least once a day, at least when we wake up, you know, remember death is certain. When it will happen is uncertain. When it happens, none of this and what this owns can be taken with us. The only thing that goes with us is the quality of our actions, our karma, both skillful and unskillful. The seeds and the results, those things will follow us, which then will lead us to, in this text, to the third thought that turns the mind, which is karma. That's coming up. Uh, 17 and 18, yeah, this is yeah, about karma, the third thought that turned the mind, and the fourth, yeah, which is nowhere yeah, in the three higher realms of samsara and in the three lower realms of samsara, yeah, nowhere in this cycle of birth and death can we find true and meaningful uh, freedom. So anyway, 17, right? It says, and yet, you know, the way I've been acting, you know, for sure, I'm not going to have uh, this human rebirth again. Hmm? Instead, you know, I will lose, you know, uh, all the advantages that I've gained. Uh, and uh, instead, all the negative uh, negativity will increase. Uh, so now, uh, when I have a chance uh, to really kind of uh, do something, uh, about the opportunity that I have now, if I don't take this opportunity and practice virtue, then where will I go but the lower realms? And it says here, you know, verse 19, never uh, when there, uh, when, when in the lower realms, uh, I will never be able to uh, uh, perform any virtues. Uh, instead, uh, my non-virtue uh, sins will just accumulate, uh, multiply, 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 yeah? to the point that even the ability to hear about uh, the happier states in samsara, even that opportunity, uh, will disappear.
now here you know we don't even need to like uh, think about uh, or, or we we can just think about like right now uh, uh, so you don't need to think about you know lower realms as something that happens you know after this life is over but even like now it's saying now when your mind is well your body is relatively well you know no major upset going on don't Take this for granted. Uh, practice the Dharma now, meaning apply the Dharma. Uh, again, the word practice, practice, practice. Sometimes it's hard to know what we're talking about. Cultivate. Grow, encourage, uh, cultivate skillful states of mind, skillful actions of body, speech, and mind. Uh, because it's, it's about creating a habit pattern. Uh, is to habitualize. Uh, so we habitualize these skillful states. So while we are of sound body and mind, meaning body and mind is you know reasonably well, now we should apply the Dharma. Now we should practice the Dharma. Because when we do this, if or, or if we don't do this while we are relatively fine, once things go wrong which is like being thrown into the lower realms, it's going to be very hard. So frankly, you know, sometimes when people uh, get in touch with me uh, and say, oh, I'm going through this problem, this suffering, that, you know, uh, what can I do? The truth is, um, I, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm just not, you know, powerful enough i suppose you know to to feel like i have anything me you know that i can say that can immediately help because in a way it's already very hard now when suffering has turned up and in that moment you you then try to do something it's going to be really hard so it's like saying you know uh when things are going well, uh, if you don't save up, you know, right? Like make hay, uh, the expression, you know, when the weather is good, you, you make hay. Uh, hay is what your farm animals need to eat when winter comes, because when during winter, no more grass, no more fresh grass. Yeah? But if you are fooled by, oh, the grass is so lush, so green, uh, and you don't take into consideration, winter is going to come. And you don't, you know, put aside uh, uh, provisions uh, for winter, then finish. Uh, in the same way, now, uh, when things are relatively stable and good, uh, take this opportunity, don't waste this opportunity. Cultivate our minds.
So verse 20, uh, Shantideva goes back to the first point he raised, which is uh, don't take for granted uh, this precious human life you have right now. Uh, then in, that's like the, the big picture. Uh, in the smaller picture, don't take for granted uh, that right now, uh, today, uh, things are relatively good, relatively fine, because you never know, you know, what kind of <laughs> trouble uh, might come and disrupt uh, uh, the kind of yeah, more or less good uh, state that you are in. So here uh, in verse 20, it says, that is why Lord Buddha has declared, uh, just like a turtle. Uh, so this example, is, uh, it says like, um, uh, so there is, a, you can say, a yoke, uh, it says here, or, or just like a, a piece of wood, uh, a, a plywood, a plank of wood floating in the great ocean. Uh, in the middle of this wood, uh, there is a hole. Mm, then at the bottom of this ocean, there's an ancient, ancient turtle uh, that every hundred years, uh, according to uh, uh, this, how the story is told, every hundred years, this turtle, and this turtle is blind, uh, every hundred years, this turtle comes up from the uh, bottom of the ocean and stick its head uh, out of the water to look at the sky. Mm. So then it says, you know, the chances of this turtle's head uh, poking through uh, the hole uh, that is in the center of this plank of wood that is floating around uh, in this ocean. Yeah? So the wood has no, no mind going, oh, I'm searching for the turtle. And the turtle has no sight yeah, to see yeah, the plank. So the chances of this head poking through the hole, uh, it says, mm, that is how hard it is uh, to get the precious human life that we have right now. Don't squander it away. The easiest way we squander this away eh, is how? Mm. We, eh, we feel, we complain, I don't have enough, things are not well, mm. my, neighbor, my neighbors annoy me, eh, the people I work with eh, don't appreciate me. Those people didn't smile at me. I feel, you know, uh, unappreciated by uh, people at the center. Uh, all sorts of things like that, you know. There is no end to um, trying to uh, balance our profit and loss uh, of our life, so to say, you know, balancing p &L. <laughs> There's no end to accounting for um, all those things in life. Even the best accountant uh, 
there's no way to balance that PL sheet of life and profit and loss accounting. Don't do that. Instead, really understand, you know, what we have is the best situation we have. And let's cultivate skillful states of mind, skillful states of the heart, so that we can be free. And when we are free, we can free others. So today we will stop at this verse. Uh, let's see uh, if there is any questions, comments. Uh, Lawrence, Larry, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Mm -hmm. uh, in another uh, work, I read about the analogy of the turtle, which I found very striking. And I did a... Uh, a rough, very rough calculation of the odds of the turtle sticking its head through the ring. Uh -huh. It's very simple. I, I just found the square footage of the oceans. In the world. <laughs> okay. And I assumed that I assumed that the yolk was a square foot. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I actually came up with a number what the probability was good <laughs> of the turtle poking its head through the ring larry is definitely spending the three hours uh, okay. beyond the lecture hour <laughs> okay so then that part is simple but then i started to think about what are the chances of us being born in this world uh -huh. and having the freedoms and the endowments that are enumerated right in the texts yes and I will tell you, uh, although I don't want to go into the details of how I arrived at some rough probabilities of these things, uh -huh. <laughs> but much to my surprise, uh, the odds of having such a, a life uh -huh. are way worse, way, way worse uh -huh. than the chances of the turtle poking its head through the ring. <laughs> okay. Yes. Just to give you an example, I said, well, right. you know, when my mother and father got together, Mm -hmm. and created me, uh -huh. I've read that when the male ejaculates sperm, uh -huh. there are 500 million individual sperm cells. Uh -huh. So right off the bat, even just looking at when your parents created you, uh -huh. the odds of you being here are <laughs> one in 500 million. Okay. All right. And then what are the chances of my mother meeting my father. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. So my, my, my father's family is from Russia. My mother's family is from Japan. <laughs> World War II happened. <laughs> <laughs> my father was in Japan. I mean, right? the chances of, of us being here are so, so low. Yeah, yeah. And, and so miraculous. And course, yeah, I, I couldn't do a precise calculation, but I will just say, it's it's orders of magnitude less yes. likely that we would be here 
than it is for the turtle to put its head through the ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we we forget how miraculous it is that we have this. Instead, you know, we come we we get distracted by uh, all the complaints, you know. Uh, this morning, you know, that guy didn't smile at me. And then for the rest of your day, you know, you have ruined it. Hmm? Someone said something mean to me for the rest of the week, yeah, you have ruined it. Uh, or, you know, uh, feelings of inadequacy, uh, which I'm not saying that, you know, like uh, you're a bad person for feeling like that. But what I am saying is, have you looked at how fortunate you are? Yeah. So translators, if you can in, translate what Larry said uh, <laughs> and my two sentences that I added. So, uh, we, we will end here today, and uh, you'll have a good weekend. Uh, and uh, those of you who are interested, uh, this evening, uh, well, evening for those of us in the Western Hemisphere, uh, but it will be Sunday morning for those of you in Asia, uh, His Eminence uh, Trisa Rinpoche, I requested him to give the reading transmission of five uh, uh, kind of important sutras and tantras. And so in the Tibetan tradition especially, there is a strong emphasis on uh, receiving the reading transmission uh, of uh, Buddhist words, Buddhist teachings which is really talking about uh, emphasizing the human-to-human -human connectivity uh, that uh, the Dharma should not just be kind of in the abstract floating around out there, uh, e even in the shape of books, you know. Uh, sure, it's good yeah, to have books and all that, uh, but it's said like the, the life, uh, the life spark uh, of these words, uh, isn't there uh, unless uh, it goes from person to person. Uh, so the reading transmission, uh, even though, you know, like maybe you think, uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I don't understand the language, but it's the attitude that we carry with us uh, that, that can kind of change the way we experience something. So those of you who are, interested you can come uh, on either facebook if you don't have the zoom information but i did share the zoom information uh, on my facebook page my personal facebook page and i'm sure other people at other centers have also shared that information
Okay, tata everyone. <laughs> Gracias, Thank you to all who are waiting, to Claudia. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Dr. Lai.